Amen. You guys ready for the word? All right. Well, we're in the middle of a series right now. This is our second week called The First Chapter. The First Chapter. And we are the first missionary church. And so in a lot of ways, this is our first chapter. This is about our first page. I I know the church has been around 114 years, but in a lot of ways, God is starting a new chapter for us. And many of you in your personal lives, you might be starting a new chapter as well. You might be starting a new season. You might be starting a new job. You might be in new relationships. You know, if, if any of these things characterize you, then I think this sermon series is going to be especially relevant for you. But if you're just even a part of this body, I believe God wants to speak something to all of us. He wants to speak something to us as we enter in this new season of life as a body. We are in our first chapter, and I, I believe that while we look through stories throughout the Bible of first chapters of different books of the Bibles, we can learn something about stepping into this next season, how to do it well, and how not to do it well. You guys ready for it? All right, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Haggai. I'll give you 20 minutes to find the book of Haggai. Don't worry, if you don't know where it's at, it doesn't mean you're less spiritual than the rest of us. I have to look every once in a while, too. It's in there, though. Dig around. Book of Haggai. Let me pray for us. Lord, this is your word. And it breathes life in us. It does something that words of a man can't do. It pierces the heart. It shapes our lives. When we hear your word, Lord, it transforms us and it can change us. We can come and gather together and come one way and leave completely different. That's what your word does. God, we give you complete access today to our hearts. Would you sharpen us? Would you break our hardenings? Would you take us into deeper things, God? We want to know you more today. I pray that our requests would be heard and granted. And I pray, Lord, that the meditations of my heart, the words of my lips, they would be acceptable and pleasing to you, God, our rock and redeemer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's start with the first verse. Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. If you're there, say I'm there. If you need a minute, say hold up. You might need to do a Google search. Haggai chapter 1. Right by Zephaniah. That should help. Thanks, Gary. (laughs) Says this. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Serubbabel, son of Shethiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Now, this verse, you might read it, and uh, while you're reading your Bible, you might just be like, the blah, 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 and the blah, 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 and you just keep moving forward. But this verse is actually incredibly important for us. Because not a lot of the prophetic books have a description like this at the beginning of this. This allows us to know the time frame of when this book was written and who this book was for. See, we can learn when we read this that during this time period, this was the year 538 B.C. So B.C., the time kind of goes backwards, okay? I know it's a little confusing. 538 B.C., the Israelite people had just spent 70 years in something called Babylonian exile. See, the Babylonians came into Israel and took captive the people and brought them into exile. They destroyed their city. They took uh, their best and most able men, made them eunuchs. It was a terrible and dark season of life. And we can read throughout the Psalms that this was a very depressing time. Oh, they dreamed of their homeland of Israel. They dreamed of the days when they used to sit by the waters and when they used to have their holy city in Jerusalem. 70 years was a hard season of life. It was tough. And so the Israelites are coming out of this Babylonian exile. And I feel like the Babylonian exile, honestly, is a good picture of what we came out of as a church, wasn't it? I mean, a dark and dry season where we thought, Lord, maybe this is it. Maybe the first missionary church is closing its doors. We talked to other churches about taking us. We, we thought this was done. And I'm sure 
the Israelites thought that they were done. It was a dark season, but God was faithful to his promise, and he delivered them into the next season of life. Now, sometimes when you switch seasons of life, sometimes God brings you from something great, and it has a happy ending into something new, and sometimes the end of seasons don't always end the best. It's not a cute cookie cutter chapter. As you enter, leave one season to the next, and this is a hard season for the Israelites, and they were ready to be done probably 20 years ago. They were like, God, we're ready to be done, but 70 years of Babylonian exile, and now they're entering into the promise. But it's very important, not only the new seasons we start stepping into them, right, but it's important to end the seasons that we step out of well as well. Because we can carry into the next season bitterness, brokenness, if we don't take care of what happened in the previous season. And so the Israelites, they're just like, and I don't blame them. They're just like, I'm just ready to start the new thing. I'm, I'm ready to step into this new thing. God, I'm, I'm ready. Goodbye, previous season. And we know finally they are entering this season. And it says this in verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. So, this is another thing we know about this book. While they exited Babylonian exile in 538 BC, we learn that in the introduction of this book, that the year is now 520 BC. Meaning, it has been 18 years since they left that last season. It has been a good chunk of time. You can do a lot of things in 18 years. And God is speaking to Haggai, and he's, he's saying to Haggai, the people, the Israelites, they have this saying about themselves. They say, oh, it's not time to build God's house yet. It's kind of like the sayings, like, we'll get around to it when we get around to it, right? They kind of had this saying. So they would go maybe to the lumber yard, and they'd say, oh, we should really get some wood for the Lord's house. Oh, it's not yet the time for the Lord's house We'll get to it eventually. And you, I mean, I don't blame them. I mean, when you exit a season, the first thing you want to do is you want to say, finally, I'm out of that season. I just want to enjoy my life. I just want to enjoy this. I just want to enjoy this time. But it's very important that we don't, in the transition, switch over to a kind of consumerism where it just becomes our pleasures, our preferences. And this is what happens to the Israelite people. Oh, it's not time to build the house of the Lord. And it says this in verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came to the, through the prophet Haggai and said, Is it time for yourselves to be living in paneled houses while my house remains a ruin? So not only have the Israelites not been building God's house for 18 years, but they started building their own houses. They started taking care of themselves. Now, I could understand if they, you know, right when they got there, they're like, I just want to rebuild my house. But it says here, God is saying, is it time for you to be living in paneled houses? This gives a picture that not only did they build their house, but they started paneling their walls. They started inviting the Jewish uh, Joanna Gaines to come in and start, like, Ooh, I would really like that couch over there, and let's, let's get this. And they get your, their house just right, while God's house remains a ruin. And I kind of don't blame them. I kind of don't blame them because, I mean, if, if my house was destroyed and I was pushed away from my homeland and I was coming back, the first thing I'd want to do is I'm like, I just want to rebuild what I had. I just, I just want my old life back. But because of that, they focused on themselves for 18 years and not the things of God. Now, we need to be very careful with when reading this because I think theologically, many people could read this and come up with some kind of asceticism this, or this kind of poverty gospel mindset of like, well, God doesn't want, you know, I need to deny myself pleasures in life for God to be happy. And that is not what I'm saying here. And that's not what we should get out of this this text. God has no problem with you building your house. God has no problem with you putting panel up on your house. The problem here is not about the pleasure that they have. The problem they have is about their priorities. 
And I've learned something about God when I'm reading this passage is that you can do a bunch of good things in the wrong order and it be the wrong thing. You can do some good things but prioritize them in the wrong way and it be the wrong thing. I've learned this this week. Me and my wife, we've ventured on the journey of potty training our firstborn. Now, she's killing it. She's doing good. Eliana is, she's picking it up really easy. She's doing really well. But she's had a couple accidents here and there. One of the accidents I remember her happen, having, she, uh, we were in the living room, and she goes, oh, 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 and I knew she had to go to the bathroom. So she runs over to her little potty in the corner. And she goes over to the potty, and she lifts it up, and I'm like, she's doing it. She's doing it. She's doing it. And she turns around and sits on the toilet and starts going to the bathroom and forgets to pull down her pants. I'm like, no, 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 no. So I run over there, and, and then she says, oh, 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 and she's pulling down her pants. And, and then she sits there, but it's too late at that point. We got a puddle on the floor. And I realized she was doing the right things, but in the wrong order. And we wonder why we're peeing on ourselves. <laughs> only, only Pastor Jordan. Okay, let's keep focusing. <laughs> Psalm 37 says this. A good man's steps are ordered by the Lord. King James Version. I know some of you all like that. Okay. His steps are ordered by the Lord. What that means is my first step is my first step. And my second step is my second step. And as I'm doing things in the right order, I'm heading in the right place. But see, you know, I grew up in this church and I love running upstairs. Now I still run upstairs today. If you, if you come around the church, you'll see me run around the stairs. But sometimes when I was a kid, I would get too excited and I'd start skipping steps and you start running. And the problem is if you skip steps, you start tripping. You start falling. For all you people 80 or older, tripping is a slang word us millennials use, okay? So whenever your grandson or daughter is messing up or doing something bad, say, y'all tripping. Everybody 80 or older, I want you to say, y'all tripping. All right, you tell your grandson or granddaughter that, okay? Tripping. And we're tripping because we got our steps misordered by the Lord. We're not allowing him to order our steps for us. It's not only important what we do, but it's also important how we do it and what order we do it. Let's keep reading. It says this. Now, this is what the Lord God Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. We're going to see that phrase a couple times. Give careful thought to your ways. That means think about it. Stop and think about what you're doing. Sometimes we get so swept away with life that we don't even think about what we're doing and why we're doing it. We just, do you, do you ever feel like you're in the current of life and you're just doing what, what, what we're supposed to be and it's, it's just taking you along? You're just being driven along with life? This is what's happening. He's saying, stop, give careful thought to your ways. Repent, metanoia. It says this, you have planted much, but you've harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never get your fill. You put on clothes, but you're never warm. You earn wages only to have a purse with holes in them. Does it ever feel like life is just a little bit too hard right now? Like things are just, it just doesn't seem like everything's just fitting or working like it should. Probably because it's not like it should. Because maybe we need to check our priorities are in line. Because when we put our priorities in line, then things tend to work how they're supposed to look. Now, it says this, like it said, it said, you've planted much, but you've harvested little. Planted much harvested little. This is like work. We work really hard. We get up real early. We work the yard. We plant as many seeds as we can, but for some reason, we're harvesting little. And that's because 
Our work is not supposed to be our provider. Our God is supposed to be our provider. And, and all these things, the problem is we, when we prioritize them, we put them in the place of God. So let's look at this first one. You've planted much, but you've harvested little. We serve the God of the harvest. And if we would submit to him first, maybe the harvest would just kind of fall into place. But because we put work in that place, we're harvesting little. We work and we work and we work. And that's American culture. We, we prioritize being a hard worker. And it's a good thing to be a hard worker, but God did not create us to toil. And we clock in early and we work and we work and we work. And then we work on the way home and then we work when we get home and we work and we work and we work. And we wonder why we're harvesting so little. Your priorities are out of order. Work has become your God. It says, you eat, but you never have enough. Do you, not, do, you, do you struggle with feeling unsatisfied in life? Maybe it's because you're turning to things to satisfy you and not God. Maybe you're turning to things to feed you and not God. That's why they call on Facebook, it's your news feed. Because we wake up and we feed and we feed and we eat and we eat and we never have our satisfaction or fill. I'm guilty of this. I was convicted this week as I was doing my study in Haggai. And I was like, oh my goodness, the first thing I do when I wake up is I grab my phone and I start reading emails. Joking, just kidding. But I realized, I'm not, the first thing I do when I wake up should not be turned to my phone. That shouldn't be my priority. So I started doing this last couple days. First thing I do is I roll out of bed and get on my knees. I say, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you that you are my God. You are my priority today. It's reordering your priorities. It says this, you drink, but you never have your fill. Now, here's the tricky thing. We all need water to live. We all need healthy things to do, but sometimes the healthy behaviors we have become a priority over the most important things as well. We can be counting our calories every part of the day, or, or we're making sure we're working out and going to the gym constantly. It says you put on clothes, but you're never warm. It says you earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in them. I've been guilty of this too. Where you don't give your finances first to the Lord. When you don't tithe your first 10% to the Lord. And I mean your first one, not just giving the scraps to the Lord. Priorities are out of line. I just want to be honest with you all. In 2017... Me and my wife, we were financially in a really hard place together. We were barely making ends meet. I was not getting paid a whole lot, and I was struggling with the Lord. I told the Lord, I said, God, I can't afford to pay my tithe. I, I'm looking at the budget right now, and I'm not even making ends meet. I'm not even figuring this out. And so for all of 2017, I didn't pay my tithe. I didn't give it back to the Lord. And I came before my wife and I said, honey, in 2018, I said, honey, I just want to let you know, pretty much all of 2017, I didn't tithe at all. I feel really convicted about it. We were in the hardest place of our life. Our bank account was in the lowest state of our life. We were struggling. And I told her, I said, honey, I just feel really convicted from the Lord. I feel like I've been robbing him. And I need to go back and make sure that I tithe the amount that I missed in 2017. And I looked at our bank account. I'm like, if I did that, we would be in the negative triple quadruple. So I said, all right, honey, this is what I'm gonna do for 2018. We're just gonna give twice our tithe every week until we catch up with where we were last year. And it was painful. You can ask my wife after the service. It was painful. It, we would have these marital discussions <laughs> and she'd say, are we still paying double the tithe? Are you sure you didn't give that time? I was like, I don't know if I didn't or not. And, and we just did. So we just did. And I felt like the Lord in that season called us to give the most generous gift we've ever given as a family to somebody. And all of a sudden, the last day, we finally gave double our tithe. We're like, thank you, Lord. That's, that's a huge weight of our, off our shoulders. A month later, we were in a healthier situation than we had ever been in our life. Because when you rewire your priorities... You put the providence in God's hands. You no longer, you take it out of your hands and, and then you only have a position to receive from God. 
And, and we wonder sometimes why things are going so hard. Sometimes hard things just happen. But sometimes, if we're honest as people of God, we make this a lot harder on ourselves than it needs to be. Our priorities. Putting our priorities in order. Jesus says it like this in Matthew 6. He says, therefore, I tell you, don't worry about anything in your life. What you'll eat, what you'll drink, about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, yet their heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about these clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow and they don't labor or spin yet. I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor were dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow will be thrown in the fire, how much more will he clothe you? You have little faith. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things. Your heavenly father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first his kingdom. Priority. Priority. That word in Greek means first. That's why I went to seminary, okay? What they use for first, it really means first. It means if you put God first, he works out the rest. But we are trained to worry about the rest and try to fit a little God in there. That's not how it's supposed to be. That's not how we're supposed to live our lives. Now, there will be some of us that might be tempted to get this twisted a little bit and think of it like this, like a pyramid. Well, as long as I put God down here, and then I put family right here, and then I worry about my job, and then whatever else I want in here, then it's all just going to kind of work in order. But what we do is we try to fit in a little bit of God, just a little bit, and then we go back to our family, we go back to our job, we go back to whatever else is in this life, and we give them the rest of our time. And that's not what God is calling us to do. It's more like this. It's more like a spider web, which God is at the center of. In every aspect of our life, we need to seek him first. Every single aspect. So not only do we seek God and then we go to our job, but we seek God first in our job. Not only do we seek God first and then we go in our marriage, but we seek God first together in our marriage. Wherever we go, we're seeking God. We're constantly in prayer with the Lord. We're constantly bringing him with every facet and every aspect of our life. It says, if we commit our ways to the Lord, he'll make our path straight. In everything we do, whether eating or drinking, do it unto the Lord. Every single thing. This will turn you into a Sunday service Christian. But this will turn you into a disciple. This will change you. This will make you a disciple of Jesus Christ every single place that you go. And this is the life that God is calling us to. When he says, seek first his kingdom, he doesn't mean check it off a list. He means seek it first in every aspect of your life. And all these things will be added to you. Don't worry about those other things. Don't prioritize those other things. Prioritize me. And it says this in Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. There he goes. He says it again. Think about it. He says that after he, you realize, oh yeah, why am I struggling so much in these areas? Give careful thought to your ways. Are, there, are these areas becoming my God in my life? Am I putting my providence as my God? Am I putting my work as as my God? Am I putting comfort as my God? What, I, what am I making God instead of putting him in that space? Give careful thoughts to your ways. I want you to give careful thoughts to your ways this morning. And it says this, go up to the mountains. 
and bring down timber and build the house of the Lord. Go up to the mountains. Where have you heard that phrase before? Make a mountain. I love that it says mountains plural. Seek God first. Drop everything you're doing. Drop all the work. Drop all the timber and go up to the mountains. Leave what you're doing right now. Okay, not I'll start on Monday or I'll start on Tuesday. Start now. Start in this place. Start on your knees at the prayer altar saying, God, you have not been first in these areas and you're going to be first today. I'm going to seek your kingdom first. I'm going to seek your kingdom in everything we do. This is incredibly important when we start new seasons of our life. Because when we start new seasons of our life, it can be very tempting and dangerous to try to take care of ourselves first. But God has not called you to take care of yourself. He will take care of you. You take care of what you need to take care of. And that's on your knees. That's with the Lord. Seek him first. You want to start out this season with the right foundation laid. You want to start this season, you want to start these relationships with the right foundation laid. You want to start this new workplace, this new life, this new area that you're stepping into the right way. And we do that by seeking first his kingdom. As a church, we need to be this way. We need to make sure our priorities are aligned with the priorities of God. What are God's priorities? Well, what did Jesus say before he left? He said, go, disciple the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And sometimes as a church, we focus on, well, we need more community time. We need more. But what I find is when we just do what God said first, all that other stuff kind of falls into place. We start focusing on outreach, then our community just naturally gets stronger. Huh, it's funny how it works that way because our priorities are in the right order. And if we keep our priorities, the priorities of God, if we keep it in this church and you keep it in your homes you keep it in your families, you keep it as an individual, God will take care of the rest. He always does. He will not forsake you. You can trust him, but when you decide to take these things yourself, you put it in your hands. And we can't handle it if it's in our own hands because there's unpredictable things that happen. He says, go up, bring down timber, and build the house of the Lord so I can take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You've expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Now, before we think of God as just this God that's going around and smiting people and punishing people, okay? God is just blowing. You can decide to go with the current or against the current. I used to be into triathlons, okay? I was a big, like, swimmer, biker, runner. This was a hobby that I was in in my mid-20s, I really enjoyed it. One thing I would do is when I would go out on bike rides, you're going like over 20 miles an hour, even a little bit of wind to your face hurts. It's hard to pedal into the wind. You guys know what I'm talking about? So what I would do is before I would start my bike rides, I would pick a course where I would never have to really go head on into the wind. I would go with the wind. I would go, and this is what John chapter 3 says, these are what the people, the spirit, people who are born of the Spirit of God. They go with the wind. They go this way or this way. And when we prioritize God, we go with the wind, not against it. See, when we, our priorities are wrong, we're going against the wind. Of course it's painful. Of course it's not working. That's not God's fault. That's ours for going against it. Why don't we just seek his kingdom? And he says, why? Because my house remains a ruin while well, each of you is building your own house. Therefore, because of this, the heavens have withdrawn their dew and the earth its crops. Do you want to know how the story ends? What do the Israelites do here? Is it a good story or is it a bad story? You can turn to Haggai chapter 2. Let's take a little peek here. Verse 15, Haggai chapter 2. It says, Now give careful thoughts to this day on, Consider how things were before one stone was laid and another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to heap of 20 measures, they only came with 10. And when anyone went to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there was only 20. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord, 
From this day on, 24 days of the ninth month, give careful thoughts to the day when the foundation of the Lord, the temple, was laid. Give careful thoughts. He's saying, I want you to think about this. Watch how this is. When your priorities were wrong, see how hard it was. Give careful thought to it. Now he says this. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. But from this day on, I will bless you. But from this day on, I will bless you. From this day on, we lay our foundation. From this day on, we set our priorities right. From this day on, we decide to do it God's way, not our way. His ways are perfect. His ways are just. His ways are righteous. God, we want to submit to your ways, not our own ways. It says, a way, there's a way to a man that leads to death. But, to, but God's way leads to life. And then it says this, the last verse. On that day, declares the Lord, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shethiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you. A signet ring. That's like a family ring. That's like my wedding ring. This is my commitment to my wife first before any other woman. Before anybody else. God says, not only will I have a ring to remind myself, you'll be that ring. That when I look at you, I remember that's my son. That's my daughter. These are the priorities of God. The kingdom of God is all about priorities as well. We don't access the kingdom of God by doing good things or good works. We access the kingdom of God by confessing our sins. And when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of our unrighteousness. When we call on the name of the Lord, we're saved. We don't have to work to get our salvation. The work comes after we're saved. And the good works come out of our salvation. It's the right orders. When you get the wrong orders, you can't build a house that way. No house can stand without a foundation. We need to lay our foundation first. I want you to bow your heads in this place. And I just want to be honest with you right now. I had a, another one of those marital discussions last night with my wife. I know. Your pastor is, has hard conversations sometimes. And we were both experiencing this burnout. And it's so funny, the day before I preached this sermon, we were frustrated, we felt tired, we felt exhausted, and we were talking with each other. And we realized our priorities were wrong. Somewhere along the lines, we got away from our priorities to date each other, to meet as a family, to have family meetings, to give each other rest and give each other breaks. We, we sat down together and we, we made a plan to make our priorities back in the order that it should be. Give careful thoughts to your ways right now. Give careful thoughts to your ways. Where are your priorities right now? Are they God's priorities? Maybe you need to go up to the mountain. Maybe in this place, whether it's at the altar here, you know, as a staff, we decided that prayer needs to be a priority for us to lay a foundation. So last week, we stopped what we were doing working. We started fixing up the prayer room a little bit so we could sneak some time in there and start praying. We need to lay the foundations. Give careful thoughts to your ways. The ways you are doing things. Is that going to be a foundation that you can build a house on? Or do you need to change your priorities? How much longer will we go down this path with these priorities? God, I thank you that you're just graciously calling us to, to you. There's no condemnation in this place. We are all prone to wander in here. Every single one of us get captivated by the world and make priorities that aren't you. Help us to seek first your kingdom, God. Help us to seek 
the things of you, your priorities. Let First Missionary Church not be a church in this next season that we're just doing things the way we want to do things. But we're actually effective. Let that be our first chapter, Lord, that we lay this foundation right now in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of you might think, man, we're doing a lot of outreach already this first year. Yeah, because that needs to be our part of our foundation. That needs to be part of our priorities. Sharing the gospel needs to be a priority. We might be thinking, well, we're already doing uh, partnership projects with City Church and other churches right off the bat. Yeah, that needs to be a priority. Jesus' Jesus's prayer in John 17 was, Lord, let them be one just as you and I are one. So we need to be one. We need to break down these walls and start partnering with other people. That's a priority. Prayer needs to be a priority. So we lay these foundations today for the future. Why don't you stand with us in this time? I want to encourage you from this day on, from this day on, God says, I will bless you. Let this be the this day on. I want to encourage you guys that if you align your priorities to God, I know last week I said if we hold on to our preferences, it holds us from the promise. If we hold on to our priorities, it can hold us from the promise too. But it says this in Haggai chapter 2, verse 23 again. It says, I will make you like a signet ring for I've chosen you, declares the Lord. Go out knowing you're chosen, that God has made you a signet ring, and to lay your foundation first. Amen. Go in peace.